we're in the middle of a collection of talks entitled Impossible. All things are possible with God, with Christ. And uh, I thought we're going to transition to a a family series today, but man, I felt like we have one more in us today, and just the direction of the Holy Spirit. And so turn your Bibles, if you've got your Bibles out with, real, with you real quick, turn to Matthew chapter 15. Matthew chapter 15, you got the U version notes, how many got that going out? We also got free Bibles for you. We would love to gift you a Bible as well. Every single week, almost every single week, someone has come up to us and saying, this is my first Bible, man. I, I'm excited to have my very first Bible. And so, man, we just love that. And I got my, my, I got my tennis shoes on today, and I'm ready. All right, we're ready. to. We're fired up today. So Matthew chapter 15, and this is at verse 21 through 28. Can you give me a little bit more monitor, uh, um, team? Then Jesus left Galilee, and he went north to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Gentile woman, say Gentile. Gentile, Gentile woman, a Gentile woman who lived there came to him pleading, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. For my daughter is possessed by a demon. Now that's like, like a literal demon, because sometimes, right, everybody, right? A literal demon that torments her severely. But Jesus gave her no reply. Jesus gave her no reply. Not even a word. Then his disciples urged him to send her away. Tell her, I love this, I just, I love that. Thank you, Matthew. The disciples told, urged Jesus to send her away. Tell her to go away, they said. She is bothering us with all her begging. Then Jesus said to the woman, I was only sent, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. The people of Israel. I find this fascinating because sometimes we paint Jesus, right? And he's just, he's Jesus, right? Like, like he's, and this is a different picture of Jesus. He goes, I've, I've come only to, for the lost sheep, the people of Israel. She came and she worshiped him, pleading again, Lord, help me. Then Jesus responded, it isn't right to take food from the children and throw it to the dogs. Take food from the children to throw it to the dogs. She replied, I love God's word. And she replied, and she said, that's true, Lord, but even dogs are allowed to eat the scraps that fall from beneath their master's table. I like this lady already. And this is what Jesus said. He says, dear woman. Dear woman, dear woman, your faith is great. Your request is granted. And, your da- and her daughter was instantly healed. The title of my message today is Dear Impossible. Dear Impossible. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Father, I pray may it, may it stop raining and let it forever be 75 degrees all year long. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen and amen and amen. Why not? Why not? Two or more gathered. Why not? 75 degrees in July. Come on, somebody. So time of message is, dear impossible, what are we willing to do for a miracle? What are we willing to do for a miracle? I want to talk about today, almost in the, and maybe a subtitle for me today, is what do we do if we haven't seen our impossible happen yet? Man, what do we do if we prayed for 21 days? What do we do when we've been having a prayer journal or, or we wrote it down somewhere and we're saying, God, this is the impossible I'm believing for. Maybe it's a doctor's report. Maybe it's a prayer request. Maybe it's even a buried dream. And after attending Avenue Church, you've been, you've been uh, encouraged to dig up those dreams again and to say, I want to believe for the impossible once more again. What if you haven't seen that happen yet? And so that's what I want to talk about today. Now, I... Um, We've been doing a 21-day fast, and uh, for us, Daniel fast is no meat, sweets, or treats. And uh, even this week, um, Pastor Lindsay, she's my partner in crime. Man, we co-lead. We do life together. And uh, so I'm going to go to the grocery store. And uh, when you get off of a Daniel fast, you try not to go back to, to the old stuff. You know, you try to wean. You know, if you already did it, try to wean off of it. And Pastor Lindsay said, when you go to a store, can you give me some M&Ms? I said, <laughs> I said, girl, you know it. <laughs> but I told myself, I'm not going to eat that M&M's. I'm not going to eat them. I'm not going to eat them. All right? I'm not, I'm not going to have any. Brought them home to her. <laughs> she, was, she was just, praise the Lord, we did it, you know. And eating them M&M's. And, uh, and even my, uh, my son Derek was like, I want one. I was like, you can't have an M&M yet. You need dinner 
first. He goes, I can't, but can I just have one? And I said, son, no one could just eat one. <laughs> no one could just eat one. It reminded me last year, um, we have a little dog named Chloe. And uh, she's a bougie, gold, uh, mini golden doodle. And uh, she's really short. And my, my, my dad came over from Phoenix. And my stepmom came. And my dad loves chocolate. Loves. He brought uh, chocolate-covered potato chips. And uh, Midwest delicacy or something. Someone just whoop, whoop, right? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I heard that. And, and so he brought those over. And my dad is, he, he doesn't have dogs. And my dad's from the Midwest where you just feed dogs, right? Here's a, here's a bone, right? And, and one night, my, my dog had a taste of the crumbs. How many of them I'm talking about? She had a taste of, of the, she had a sample of just the crumbs. And how many know you just can't eat one? And so we, we left the, the chips, the chocolate-covered chips in the middle of the dining table. We, we went out. I think we went to dinner. And when we came back, the chips were gone. And we realized our dog moved and used her snout, moved the chair, hopped on the chair, hopped on the dining table, gross, and ate all the chips. Why? Because she had a taste. I just wonder if we walk out of here today having just a taste of what God can do in our lives. Just a taste, just, just an inkling. If you walked in here and you said, I don't believe in God, or I'm agnostic, or I'm an atheist, but what if you just had a taste of what God can do? I'm sorry, I just spit on my wife. If you just have a taste of what God can do in your life. But here's what I think sometimes that stops us. And this is what happens in the Bible. She comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, heal my demon-possessed daughter. And this is what Jesus said. Jesus gave her no reply. Not even a word. His disciples urged him, send her away. Just come on. She's begging. If you're not going to say anything, just. I want to ask you today, man, what do we do when we don't hear from God? What do we do when there's silence in our prayers? Man, what do we do when we just don't feel or hear the Lord? I want to encourage you today. If that's been your 21 days, and I know some people are continuing on, but I want to encourage you, there's always a test in the silence. How many of you have ever taken a test in, in high school or uh, maybe a, a nurse test or a driver's test, you know, whatever, anytime you take a test. Now, I've tried this in high school. So if you're in high school, all right, Jameer, if you're in high school and you go, excuse me, teacher, during the test, you go, what's the answer to number five? <laughs> How many know a teacher is going to say, shh? You're taking a test. I wonder if God's like that. I wonder if God is saying, ah, you're in the middle of a test. Same way God tested Abraham, it could be the same way he's testing us. But I want you to understand this story. There's two main characters. There's the disciples, God's men, and then there's a Gentile woman. But I want you to understand this. If we read this portion of Scripture, the silence was to test the disciples not the Gentile woman. It was to test them. Not to test the one who already had the faith. It's so many times, I wonder how many of us are believing for the impossible, but God is going, hold up. I, I know you're praying for a man, but he's got to pass the test first before I give him to you. And then go right there on Sunday morning, come on. I, I, I know you want that job. But I got a few tests, a few people that need to go through a few tests. I, I, God, I, I really believe that, that man, I really love God's timing, but I've learned to trust his timing more. Because sometimes I want things in my life, and God is saying, no, Jeremy, I'm testing you. Or no, Jeremy, I'm testing this situation. No, Jeremy, I'm moving the chess pieces around in heaven. And the more I'm praying, God is going, just hold on. Don't quit, because it's just a moment. It's going to be perfect. Because his timing is perfect. Because I really believe Jesus uses every miracle for a greater purpose. My God does not waste miracles. Now, if you're brand new today, I'm, I'm going to get wild today. I'm just fired up. It was, it was worship night. It was fasting and praying. It was uh, kids. No. <laughs> because God doesn't waste miracles. 
And here's what's fascinating. The Bible said Jesus and the disciples, they left Tyre and, and, and they went, they, they, left, they, left, they left Galilee and they traveled 30 miles. 30 miles, no car, no motorcycle, no Harley. They, they traveled by walking. So they walked 30 miles. And the reason why they walked 30 miles was to get away from the Pharisees and the Sadducees in the, in, in the Gentile, or in, the, in Galilee, in the holy city. And then they go down to the Gentile city. And I wrote this. Jesus is in the middle. He's in the center of a Gentile city. He's, and a Gentile woman walks into a Gentile's house. And here's the disciples. Disciples just travel 30 miles on foot. Disciples have been with Jesus. They're in the middle of a Gentile city in a Gentile's house, and a Gentile woman comes up, and this is what they say. They're already upset. They're already agitated. I've seen some of y'all in the 21-day Daniel fast. You're hangry. (laughs) And this is what they said. Tell her to go away. She's bothering us with all her begging. Friends, you haven't seen the impossible happen yet, I believe the word of the Lord for you today is I want you to get bothered. I want you to get bothered. Think about this. They're in a Gentile city, in a Gentile house, and a Gentile woman comes in. Now, back in the Bible times, Gentile was the opposite of God's people. Believe different than me. Think differently than me. And sometimes we get bothered when we live in Sin City around a culture that's not Bible-believing, in a society that doesn't believe what we believe, and instead of witnessing or loving, we get bothered. We get upset. But I'm here to tell you, what bothers you is often a sign of what's inside of you. Of what's inside of you. It's almost like I wonder if Jesus smirked a little bit when he saw her walk into the house. And he said, perfect. Perfect. Because what bothers you is, this, is a sign of what's inside of you. And friends, I've never said this before, but what's inside of you that is bothering you is either a solution to the problem or an issue inside of you. So things that bother you, either that you're the solution or God needs to do a, a work in our hearts. Those people, God say, man, you need some love in your heart. Man, you need the fruit of the Spirit in your heart. Those, I can't believe. Some of y'all need to turn off the news because that's all they're going to feed you. And you need to go to the streets. We just need to love people. Man, maybe what bothers you, there's things that bother me. There's things that bother me, but, I mean, there's things that bother me. A lot of things that bother me. People's driving bothers me. But maybe that's just a test of my Christianity. Instead of telling them they're number one, I just go, praise the Lord. I pray for you. I'm praying for you. I'm praying for you. I've heard this older generation, so this next generation bothers me. Oh, my gosh, they're lazy. Oh, my gosh, they're just there. They know nothing. This next generation, they're, go- they're going to hell in a handbasket. Well, maybe what bothers you is because God put knowledge and wisdom inside of you to mentor this next generation. Maybe this next generation is going, who will mentor me? Maybe this next generation is saying, who will invest into me? And the only thing that's accessible is TikTok, Instagram. Sorry, they're not on Facebook no more. But maybe they're looking for you to tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, can I invest in you? Can I talk to you? Can I share with you? Man, what bothers you? Is normally a solution that God has placed on the inside of you. I know people that walk into a church and go, this bothers me. That's because you're the, you know the solution. You know the solution. So I want to ask you this morning, what is bothering you is either a solution or it's an issue. Man, maybe you need to repent or maybe you need to move. Not move from this church or move from this city, but maybe you need to move. Maybe you need to tap someone on the shoulder. Maybe you need to say, I'll get involved in this church. Maybe you see, I, I need to go to a small group. Now, hear me out. I told Pastor Lindsay, someday we're going to retire. Someday we're going to pass this church along because this church is going to go on forever in Jesus' name. And someday we're going to live somewhere exotic like Inspirata, you know, like, or Hawaii, you know, or whatever. Someday. 
We're going to be old in age. What are we going to do? Are we going to isolate in our house? No. We're going to find a life-giving church. And we're going to serve. And we're going to go to small groups. Why? So we can build friendships and relationships. That's why. Okay. And then he said to the disciples, and I love this, I wonder if any of us, and this is Matthew chapter 9, I wonder of us if any of us are bothered enough to move. Are we bothered enough to get involved? Are we bothered enough instead of saying, get him out of here, I'm, I'm done, right. for us to say, sign me up. Yeah. Sign me up. I'll, I'll do anything, anywhere, anyhow, anytime. Because Jesus says the harvest is plentiful. And can I give you a different translation? The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his fields. The harvest is ready. There's, there's, there's a whole city called Sin City. There's a, whole, there's a whole country called United States of America. But I wonder if, if the harvest is great, but there's not enough people that are bothered enough to move, to make a difference, to change the harvest. You know, this last Sunday, you know what I saw in our worship night? I saw people that were bothered enough to press into the presence of the Lord. Bothered enough to say, I don't care if I'm on my knees. I don't care if I got snot coming out of my nose. I don't care if anyone thinks anything. I'm bothered enough to see my miracle. I'm bothered enough. That's good. I know. Man, we got plenty of people that were bothered enough to jump on a camera today for our online audience. Enough people bothered enough to work the screens, to sink up on the stage. There's enough, hear me, there's enough people bothered enough to not, that we don't have child care, but we have church for kids. That they're watching our kiddos right now. Man, they were bothered enough one day to sign up and say, I'll jump in that room so that moms and dads can come in here and experience the presence of God. Man, I'm bothered enough to come here on a Wednesday night and serve our, young, our, uh, our high, middle schoolers and high schoolers. They were bothered enough. Can I tell you this? Uh, we are a portable church. We, everything you see here, we set it up and we tear it down. Everything except for the stage, maybe the screen, some lights, but everything else, we set it up and we tear it down. Can I just applaud our production team that we don't have that many issues? Come on. But you know, it's not very fun to set up and tear down a church. But can I just tell you, there is a group, and we call them the Red Team. They're part of our setup team. But there's a group called the Red Team, and it's called Retired and Extremely Dangerous. And, and, and we have this team. They, they're literally setting up our entire church. But can I just tell you, we need more people that are bothered enough to go to bed early on a Saturday to wake up early on a Sunday, to come here when this place is empty, to set up every chair, every banner. Man, we need people that are bothered enough to come in and tear down the church. We need people that are bothered enough to witness to their coworker, to witness to their friends. But here's what I think the test was for the disciples. The test was Jesus, I really believe, was trying to teach them this very important question. Do you want the impossible to happen to others? even if it hasn't happened for you. And he shifted it. How do I know this, Pastor Jeremy? How do you know this is what he really meant? Because you know some preachers, they can twist things around to make their agenda know. But here's what Jesus said. Jesus said to the woman, excuse me, I was sent only to help God's lost sheep, the people of Israel. And what Jesus is saying is biblical. If you study all throughout the Old Testament, Jesus actually came to fulfill the law. And I want you to know, Jesus, yes, he came for Israel first. And he came, and the reason why he came for Israel was to fulfill Scripture that Israel's God's people. The whole teaching in there, but Paul helps us to bring it together. Because the disciples, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees said, someday there's a Savior or Deliverer who's coming to help the people of Israel, God's people people this morning. And I want you to see this. Jesus came for Israel first. But in Romans chapter 1, it says this. Paul's wraps it around. Paul says, guys, you're so close. But this is what it says. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work saving everyone who believes. Israel first. But watch this. The Jews first and also the Gentile. 
Sometimes we get like that in the church world. It's just me versus them. The church versus them. Culture, blah, 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 Taylor Swift, all of them, you know. <laughs> but Paul says, guys, you're close. But he came to fulfill the law for coming for God's people first. But then he came for everyone else. You know what God's roadmap was by sending Jesus Christ? Is that his roadmap was to equip God's people to bring the good news to everyone. To everyone. To the, to the, not just the Jews, the Greeks, the Gentiles, the Romans, everyone. Everyone. Why is that so significant? Because well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, even though, even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family bringing us to himself through Christ Jesus. This is what he wanted to do. So not only did he come for Israel first, but he adopted us into his family. He adopted us into his family. And here's the portion of Scripture I've never preached on before. It says that Jesus responded, it's not right to take food from the children and to throw it to the dogs. I always read this and went, dang, Jesus. And just kept reading on. Wow. It's one of those scriptures where you go, God, it's so good. I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> Mark tells the very same story. We're in Matthew. But Mark was also there. John Mark. And this is what John Mark said. John said, right away a woman who heard about Jesus came and fell at his feet. Her little girl was possessed by an evil spirit. She begged him to cast a demon out from her daughter. Since she was a Gentile, and here's what's crucial, born in Syrian. And so this was telling us. Uh, I'm not saying this word. In Syrian Phoenix. And this is what this tells us. This tells us that she was a Gentile woman. But she spoke Greek. And what's fascinating is God's people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, were not, they're not part of God's people, but they thought they were God's people. They were actually so ingrained in the term Israel only or Israel first that their religion became a political party. And so this young lady came in. She was Greek. She had a different affiliation. But not only was she wasn't born in the right family, she also didn't speak their language. She didn't talk like them. She didn't look like them. She wasn't them. And so when Jesus said, All right, you, you want, we're not going to take food from the children and give it to the dogs. The reason why the disciples went, ooh, and all of us here go, ooh, because the context was different. Theologians believe Jesus actually spoke to her in Greek. There's a theological term that God's not going to speak to you the way he speaks to me. He's going to speak to you the way you understand. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So if, you, if you're sitting in, in your prayer time, God's not going to go, Keegan, thou art, th and you're like, what? <laughs> What'd you say? Syrian phoenix? <laughs> okay, I tied up back in. I tried. I tried. God's going to speak to us to our own understanding. You know, there's a, my youth pastor was from Canada, and, and he brought an American friend to go back to his home church at a big conference there. And his, and his friend from America was in Canada, started preaching. And he was preaching about the story of trying to catch this sheep. And he was tying in sheep to God's people. And, and in the story, he kept saying, that little bugger. And all the kids in the room went, oh. And he was like, Oh, yeah, bugger, and the, and the little bugger got away, and finally I caught that bugger. And the kids were going like, oh, oh, like it hurt them. And afterwards, he was like, what, what did I do? I mean, they got saved, and they answered the altar call. He goes, but what did I do? And my youth pastor's laughing because he's, you know, he's morbid. He's cracking up. And he goes, bugger is a swear word in Canada because <laughs> it's a different language. So when the disciples heard dog or when we hear dog, we go, ooh. But what Jesus was doing was he was actually provoking her faith. 
He was challenging her because that wasn't the first time she heard it. Jews would often tell Gentiles, you're dogs. You don't belong here. Jews would often call Gentiles or even, even rabbit dogs or wild dogs, but Jesus used this particular uh, a, a dog in the original language is actually just a house pet. And he says, are we supposed to take food from the children and give it to the house pets? And she went, oh. And what Jesus did in that moment, which is so fascinating to me, Jesus didn't talk down to her, but Jesus reminded her or provoked her, and she said, oh. I see what you're doing because there's always context. You can say you're a dog or you can say you're a dog, aren't you? And what happened was she saw her, it gave herself permission and she shifted from her label to her position. Her label was Gentile or a dog or less than or second place or third place. But when Jesus said, do we take food from the children to give it to the dogs, she shifted from her label to her position. I believe you're going to see the impossible happen in your life when you walk away from the label. I'm not good enough. I'm a nobody. I'm too condemned. If I walk into this building, it's going to burn down. I am whatever the label that has been placed on you. You're good. You're no good for nothing. How dare you read God's word? How dare you translate? How dare you pray? How dare you worship? And she said, that's not who I am. Because even dogs could get crumbs from the table. And this is what happened is she removed her false label. But she replied, that's true, Lord. Even dogs are allowed to eat scraps off the table. But here's what's fascinating according to Mark. I'm, I'm teaching here for a moment. What's fascinating to Mark, she was actually a, what they call a prilosect. And that is a, see, I said that word. And she's a, she's a Gentile that actually converted to Judaism. They didn't know a woman of God walked into that room. You know, I play Uno with my uh, six-year-old. And it's fun because he and I co co conspire against mom. And if I don't do a good enough job, he, co he, co he, he teams up with her. And it's funny when we look at each other and he goes, I got a trick card. And I, I got a trick card too. And mom's like, I'm right here. So I'll throw down the reverse card. He'll throw down plus two. Right? Mom will throw down plus two. I'll throw down plus two. He'll throw down. Uh, got the Uno card, right? Can I just tell you? She had the Uno card, and that was the word of God. Because when she walked in, she said, I hear you. I, Jesus, I caught that. Jesus, I, children and, and the dogs. Because she, theologians believe, she had Genesis chapter 12 in her back pocket. And she said, Jesus, according to the, the Bible, it says, I will make you into a great nation, talking to Abraham. I will bless you, make you famous. You will be a blessing to others. I will bless you. This is way before Jesus' time in Genesis. And she says, I will bless you and those who bless you. I curse those who will treat you with contempt. All families around the dinner table, all families on earth will be blessed through you. And so she said, yeah, 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 dogs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I may be a dog in their eyes, but I know where my position is. Because she realized no one can stop the promises of God. No one can stop the promises of God. Will you stand with me, please? I'm going to close and pray with you for a moment. And I want you to grab your communion elements real quick. But I think, friends, sometimes, sometimes we forget about our position and it's all about our labels it's all about our labels and I hope I have everyone's attention at this moment I can just hold on to this but I want to ask you two questions this morning the first one is do you need a miracle enough does your need for a miracle bother you enough to get uncomfortable Because you know what she could have done? She could have been like a nice, Gentile woman on a Sunday morning. Come in and say, Jesus, help me! And people are going, shh, we're in church. Quiet. 
Why are you standing up? Why are you coming front? Why are you going to prayer? What, what's your deal? But it's that three different times. Jesus, help me. Jesus, help me. Even dogs get crumbs. Because you know what her crumb was? For her daughter to be healed. That was it. I feel the same way. Just give me a crumb. I remember one night, I was 17 years old, came from another church revival. I was a revival seeker looking for Jesus to heal my ears. I'm deaf in this year, 60% deaf in this year. And we're hearing AIDS. That's why big words are hurtful. And I remember I didn't get healed. My faith wasn't great enough. I remember I dropped off a friend at his house. And as I was driving home, I got mad. I remember I hit the steering wheel as hard as I could, pulled over the side of the road, and just rage came out of my heart. Just, just, I yelled at him in my truck. Somebody was walking that night that probably thought a psychopath was in his truck. And in that moment, God spoke to me. It was so, I just, I knew that I knew that I knew. It was, my, it was a burning bush experience for me. And the Lord said, I will heal you when I'm most glorified. And just a word, just a crumb. Just, a, I don't know why I did that, but just a crumb. Just a crumb. Was all I've needed for the past 20 years. Just a crumb. Just a crumb. But are you, are you, are you bothered enough to get uncomfortable? That's my first question. My second question is, Maybe you're here and you think, Pastor, I'm good. I'm good. Money in the bank, kids are healthy. Love my job, love my life. I'm good. About to go home. Enjoy the rest of my day. I want to ask you, does, does the harvest bother you enough to do something about it? Does the harvest bother you enough to come early, to be first, to leave last? Does the harvest bother you enough to pray for other people's miracles? To say, I'm believing for you. I'm praying for you. I'm calling down heaven for you. Does the harvest bother you enough? And so I'm just going to really quick, I'm not going to make this long. But if you're number one, if you're bothered enough to get uncomfortable, will you take your communion? Will you just step on the aisle? Will you just come forward? I just want to pray with you. It's a step of faith. Just like the woman. I just want to crumb. I just... I need a miracle today. And that's all we're going to do. That's all we're going to do this morning. I want you to come forward, come forward, come a little closer too. That's my first question today. And man, we're going to call down heaven and earth for you. We're also going to do Holy Communion together in just a moment. That's my first question. Are you bothered enough to get uncomfortable? Are you bothered enough to say, yeah, and I love, and I love this, this action right here, faith without works is dead. This is, this is a step of faith. God, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm bothered enough to believe. But the second question is, does the harvest bother you enough? Maybe there's something inside of you that God wants to pull more empathy and compassion for others. Say, I'm good. Yeah, but we're not. I'm not. So I want to ask you, will you step forward and when you come behind somebody, will you lay a hand on their shoulder? And I want you to pray for them and believe for them your first time today. We've never done this before. But I want you to come forward. I want you to lay a hand on them. And I want to remove the label that you've placed on yourself, the label that the enemy has placed on you. To say, how dare you come up and lay hands on somebody? How dare you come to church today? How dare you believe? What we're going to do is I'm going to do Holy Communion. We're going to take it together as they're praying for you behind you. And here's what I love about Holy Communion. Holy Communion represents what Jesus did on the cross. What he did on the cross was by his stripes we are healed. By his stripes we are redeemed. Man, his iniquity, our iniquity was upon him. By the cross we are saved, but by the cross we're healed. But friends, God's not going to give us crumbs. He's going to give us the cross. And the cross is completion. So with every head bowed, eye closed, go ahead and get rid of the first top of that label on your communion cup and Jesus we thank you for your word 
Father, I thank you for what you did on that cross. As I take that little wafer, I'm going to break it, which represents you were broken on the cross for me. If you're at home, I want you to find some communion elements, break something. Father, I thank you that by your death, we are saved. So go ahead and eat that real quick. And I love the juice. I love the blood. This juice here is just, just grape juice. But this represents the blood that was shed on the cross. So I really believe it's symbolic that by his blood, by his stripes, we are healed. So when we drink this, I want us to pray. And I want to say, thank you, Jesus, that all things are possible through Christ. Let's go ahead and drink this. Come on, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you. Father, thank you for every single person that's up here today. The Father, I pray, will you move heaven and earth for them today? The Father, I pray, will you begin to answer prayers today? The Father, I pray, you begin to change perspectives today. The Father, I pray for those that are behind them. Father, I pray you begin to increase a compassion and a fervor and a fire on the inside of us. The Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus, may we call down heaven to earth for them today. Father, I pray will you do signs and wonders and miracles today. Father, I pray for your grace and for your mercy today. Father, I pray you begin to answer prayers today. Father, even the crumbs from the table fall down. So, Father, I thank you. You didn't bring us crumbs, but you brought us to cross. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. In Jesus' name. 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 me a favor with every head out of eye closed. I want you to pray this prayer with me. And this is the prayer we pray every single Sunday. But I believe this can be your prayer today. This is the prayer that you need this prayer. This is your prayer on this Sunday morning. I'm going to lift your voice and say, dear Jesus, say thank you for dying on the cross. Say forgive me of my sins. Say be Lord of my life. Say the best way you know how. I'm going to live for you. Say no more crumbs. Only the cross. Because I now know who I am. I'm saved. I'm redeemed. I'm a child of God. Come on, everybody. Give God a shout today. Come on.